Okay, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's virtual plant clinic. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida Extension Service here in beautiful Hernando County. And this morning, at the moment, I'm here all alone. Our Master Gardener, Bernie, who is normally here with us, is attending a conference over in Sumter County today. And our Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Colby, will hopefully be along here shortly. So at the moment, it's just you and me here. But if you guys have any kind of lawn and garden questions, anything you'd like to ask about insect pests, diseases, your lawns, your landscape plantings, go ahead and put your questions in the comments and I will do my very best to help answer them. So I'm not completely alone here this morning. Bill is with us. Good morning, Bill. And Monique is here also. So, oh, look, all these people here. So I don't feel quite as lonely as I did. Buddy, how are you doing? And Basem, good morning. How are you? Um, I'm back. Last week, I was gone. Can you remember exactly where I was, what I was doing? Um, it gets a little confusing, especially this time of year as we start to go into spring. We get a lot more questions. We still have huge numbers of people moving to Florida, a lot of brand new residents, new to Florida residents. They don't know anything about their lawn or their palm trees. And then we get close to Earth Day and we're getting speaking requests and people want me to come and speak to their homeowners association or club or civic group. Tuesday, I was in downtown Orlando speaking to the Florida Groundwater Association because we have a program where we teach people about their septic systems and we're giving a presentation to them about that. So busy time of year here as it starts to warm up. And I noticed this morning, it's beautiful out there. It's nice and warm. I hate the cold. Some of the weather recently, uh, windy and down to around freezing, and the temperature goes up by two degrees during the day. I do not like that at all. So I'm enjoying the nice warmer temperatures, and that can cause some problems, believe it or not, in your landscape. Because during winter, when the weather bobbles, it, it gets warm, it gets cold, and it gets warm again. And then if it gets really cold again, that can confuse a lot of your plants. So right now, if we get a couple days to a week or so, all depending on where in Florida you live, I'm sure Buddy up in the Panhandle, colder up there than it is here. And then some of you, you know, anybody, Corey, who lives in Pasco County, or anybody listening who lives in uh, Pinellas or a little further south, it's a little bit warmer down there. Um, what happens is it warms up and now your azaleas try to bloom. Some of your fruit crops try to bloom. If you have peaches, they might try to bloom. Your hibiscus is gonna start getting some nice, beautiful new growth and little tiny leaves. And then what happens in two weeks when another front comes through and we have a major freeze you end up with major damage. You lose a lot of the flowers. You lose a lot of the brand new little leaves on your plants. And now your plants, had they become just really well accumulated, you know, used to the cold, would have gotten a little bit of damage. But because the plants thought it was spring, they start actively growing. Uh, they get a lot of damage from those late freezes and frosts. So, Buddy says, 68 up there. Um, I saw on the news... I, this morning, we were in the 60s here. I believe you're in the 60s in the Panhandle, even all the way up into Tennessee and the Carolinas, it was at least 50s. So it's nice all the way up and down the East Coast. So that can cause a lot of problems in your landscape. So don't put away all the, the blankets and coverings and everything else that you use to protect those cold sensitive plants. Don't put them away quite yet. You know, put them off in a corner in the garage and keep them handy because you will probably need them again. We're probably gonna get more cold weather. And Corey says his mulberries get messed up by this all the time. They have some later blooming mulberries that aren't triggered to flower so easily. Yeah, there's a lot of fruit crops. You know, there's, I've seen, um, and it seems like especially peaches, 
young peach trees will get confused and they'll flower a little bit pretty much any time of the year. Azaleas would do the same thing. They'll get a few flowers in, you know, in January and in spring when they're supposed to, and in July and in November, some plants just seem to be a little bit more confused than others. But on the plus side, for any fruit trees and plants you have that need a decent amount of cold temperatures to bloom properly, if they're late blooming, they should do really well this year because we've gotten quite a bit of cold weather and what a lot of fruiting plants need is chill hours. So these are the number of hours where the temperature is below about 40 degrees or so. So not freezing, but chilly. So, and you can get different fruit crops that are uh, rated by that. For example, you can find varieties of peaches that need maybe 250, 300 chill hours. And they will grow here in Central Florida around Hernando County because that's about how many chill hours we get a year here. You can look in a catalog at a beautiful peach tree that gets, you know, beautiful, tasty peaches. It's some kind of special variety or whatever. You have to be very careful to see how many chill hours it needs because it may need 2,000 chill hours. And in Ohio, you get that many chill hours. You don't get anywhere near that many down here in Florida. So a lot of different fruit tree crops are rated by the number of chill hours. You have to make sure it's appropriate for wherever you live. Here in Hernando County, as a general rule, we get an average of 350. But it seems like every year we get either more or less. And a lot of times we get a bit less than that here. So Monique said it went down to 33, but nothing was affected, not even coleus. You know, I noticed that also it got down to right about 33 at my house in Spring Hill. And I have bananas that I didn't even try to cover. I have some small dragon fruit plants. I threw a sheet over. Um, what else did I have? Uh, I have lemongrass that will freeze back. I have uh, croton and nothing was damaged. It got almost almost cold enough where everything froze and got damaged but not quite i'm thinking like we got so close where it had it been one degree lower i would have seen some damage on things i didn't even get damage yet on the bananas which is fantastic they're usually the first to show a lot of damage so corey says that he doesn't have a chill hour weather station near him that makes sense what are your guesses on our chill hours or what mine might be in a colder spot? I have not checked and I really don't know how many technically we've gotten here in Hernando County, but you raise some good points. It really depends on exactly where you live because you could be in a slightly colder spot. Um, I could live five miles from you, but the, my property might be a little bit higher. I'm a little bit warmer. If my property is lower, it's a little bit colder. If I live five miles closer to the beach and the coast than you do, I'm a couple degrees warmer. And a lot of times it's that one, two, three degrees one way or the other that makes a huge amount of difference between chill hours and not chill hours, freeze damage and no freeze damage. Just a couple degrees make a really big difference. Um, University of Florida does have the fawn system the Florida Agriculture Weather Network. And if Teresa can look, I think Teresa is lurking in the background today. If you can look up information on the Fawn, University of Florida's Fawn Network and maybe their website, they do have weather stations around the state and they do track the number of chill hours they've gotten at the station. But that may not be the same as at your house, even though you're, you know, 5, 10, 20 miles away, because the exact temperature at your location does make a huge amount of difference. And looks like Teresa is lurking in the background here today, so, so I'm not quite as lonely. Um, she says that in zone 9B, it's, as a general rule, 110 to 310 chill hours, and that includes extreme South Texas. 
that varies year by year. It seems like we never have an average year. It's either warmer or colder. And we'll get a couple of slightly warmer years. And then every once in a while, we'll get a long, consistently cold winter. And I could tell you from experience with a lot of the fruiting trees, the peaches, the plums, um, probably blueberries and blackberries also, that extra cold, steady cold during the winter, they absolutely love that. And sometimes you'll get bumper flowering and a bumper crop of fruit. So yes, University of Florida does have the fawn service or system, and there is a link to their website. They have a lot of good information there. If you're really into weather and temperatures and high temperatures, low temperatures, how much rain you've gotten on average over the last week, month, year, whatever it might be, they are a wealth of information. And they have weather stations around the state. I thought that they have one in Dade City. I know they really don't have one in Hernando County that I know of. I think maybe the closest one to us here in Hernando is Dade City. So they have a lot of good information there if you're really, if you're kind of a weather fanatic. Or, you know, what you could do, just go out and purchase the equipment, set up your own little weather station in your own backyard. A lot of people do that and they keep track of the high temperatures, low temperatures, rainfall, everything else. And that if you're kind of a hardcore gardener, especially if you're growing fruits and vegetables, gives you a lot of really good insight as to why what you're growing, when you're growing it, is either doing unusually well this year or doing unusually bad this year. Because weather can be a component and play into that. And if you keep track of the weather year after year, that is some really valuable data when you're trying to make adjustments for, hmm, when should I start my cucumbers this year? Should I start them earlier? Did I start them too early last year? Do I start them later this year? That's going to help you with making those decisions. And Teresa put a link to University of Florida fact sheet on growing mulberries. Mulberries grow very well here. You don't want to grow the paper white mulberries. They are highly invasive, but the red black mulberries, black ones, I grew up in Maryland, and we have mulberries where I grew up in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C., and when we were kids, we'd throw them at each other. The dark mulberries, they make stains on your shirt that just never come out, so, so keep that in mind, guys. Don't throw them at each other either. Corey asks everybody's favorite question, what are you planting this week? My poor vegetable garden has been somewhat abandoned and neglected especially the last maybe two three weeks some days it was just i was just too busy and it was way too cold for me to go out there and do a whole heck of a lot in the garden so not much got done what everybody else should be doing and what i need to get busy doing get those tomatoes peppers and um eggplants all started the transplants you're going to need them up and growing and going to either stick in containers or in the ground late February, early March. I am going to get some compost from the Hernando County Solid Waste Department at the landfill up in North Hernando County. And I'm gonna start my own little experiment in my backyard growing summer squash, zucchini and yellow squash and cucumbers in buckets. I'm gonna start them soon. I need to get them set. I need to pick up the compost and start them beginning of February. And that is too cold to grow them. If we get a freeze, it will freeze them and kill them, they'll turn to mush. So I may have to be able to carry those buckets into the garage, keep them warm. So it's an experiment. I'm gonna try getting them in really early to see if they do better. If you plant summer squash and cucumbers a little bit too late, things are not gonna work out very well. You're gonna get overwhelmed by insects, diseases, and you will probably not get any actual harvestable food off of them. If you try growing them in July, when you grow them up in Maine or New Hampshire, things will definitely not work out well. You won't get any cucumbers or summer squash. Um, I have broccoli that's coming in, like the broccoli heads are forming. Uh, I think I have the first head that's ready to be picked. I have green leaf lettuce and red leaf lettuce that's ready to be harvested. 
I still have some leftover hot pepper plants from this past summer that grew great during the fall. I was able to pick up pick a ton of cayenne peppers, and they're really, really hot, too. And I dried them, turned it into cayenne pepper powder, uh, and they did not freeze and die. They're looking a little ratty from the cold, but they're still going along. So I'm going to see how long I can keep them going. Um, so that's what I have going on in my garden. Basically, you need to be thinking, finishing up with winter and preparing, getting things started and all ready to go in the ground and get, get growing very, very soon for spring. Because before you know it, spring is going to be here. Good morning, Diana. How are you? See, I have all these people keeping me company here. So even on these days when I'm here all by myself, that's just fine. I won't get lonely. Um, yeah, Monique has a problem with the, the paper. They call them white mulberries or paper mulberries. They are very, very invasive. And if you have one, pretty soon you're going to have a thousand of them. They're very difficult to get rid of. You have to be diligent and keep cutting them down, tearing them out, digging them out. If you keep on top of them, you can get rid of them. And Catherine asked a really good question about, is the compost free there at the Hernando County um, Solid Waste Department's landfill up in north? It's almost up to the Citrus County line. They do have... Um, yard waste there that you could still pick up for free works okay as a mulch around ornamental plantings but it there's a lot of junk in it so all the trash and beer cans and everything else that come in with all of it it all gets ground up you can go pick it up it's free but it's not very good hernando county solid waste department has a program where they are starting to uh take all the different um yard waste and things that can be composted and they're going to compost all of it on an industrial scale we were just given uh, a very large grant from the united states department of agriculture and i believe we're applying for one from environmental protection agency so we're in the process of working on that within the next year or so they will be up and running and have compost produced that local residents can go up there with a the pickup truck and pick up they're going to, they have a bagger, so you can go up there and, and get bags, 40-pound bags, just like you would at a Home Depot or Lowe's of compost. There will most likely be a charge for it, but it will be a very small charge. The charge is just going to be to defray the equipment they have to buy to do that with. And um, I'm working on that a lot. I'm going to have uh, my county partner, Leanna, Teague, I'm, I'll get a hold of her and I'll, we'll have her on here as a guest. She can explain to you the actual producing the compost with huge trucks, a huge screener, bulldozers, massive piles all being composted. She's much more familiar with that. I'm a lot more familiar with the education component. We do have a program where we're going to be teaching local farmers about the benefits of compost with whatever they're growing because compost is great. No matter what you're growing, it's going to help them make grow make it grow better. We're going to do a series of classes for them coming up. So I'll have Liana on here really soon to explain just what the heck they're doing up there. But I need to go within the next few weeks and pick up just a few buckets of my own. I'm going to grow things in five-gallon buckets. I'm going to make it half potting soil and half compost. And I'm going to see what happens. See how well the cucumbers, yellow squash... I might try growing eggplants in it also. We'll see. Not really sure yet. Buddy asks, what is my opinion on biochar? Biochar can be a very valuable um, growing media mixed in with the soil, so you're not growing one in 100% biochar. That is basically wood and high-carbon material that's been burned at a very high temperature and very low oxygen. So that you end up with charcoal, but this isn't the same as the bags of charcoal that you buy to, you know, cook your hamburgers and hot dogs on. Uh, you don't want to use that because that's produced differently. That's going to have toxic ingredients in it. But biochar is using just chopped down wood and burning it, grinding it, and the the ash 
and the charred remains is very, very high in carbon, very good in the soil, and very good for growing plants. I'm not really an expert on it. I've never given a class on biochar. But you know what? I'll go ahead and add that to the list of different classes that I need to find an expert on. So thanks for the suggestion, buddy. I'll go ahead and um, find a University of Florida expert that knows more about it than I do and have them on and do a class. And Diana asks, is it too late to plant broccoli and cabbage? Probably. The broccoli, cabbage, lettuces, beets, radishes, turnips, kale, all those cool season things that you hopefully have all growing in your garden right now, you need to plan on them being done by maybe March 15th at the very latest. After that, it gets too hot to grow them. And you're going to have a lot of problems. You're going to have bugs that you don't have during the winter. But March and after that is spring rapidly shooting into summer. You will have, oh my gosh, I've seen huge outbreaks of harlequin bugs, Colorado potato beetles. Aphids will come out in mass. You will have, your plants will all be eaten up with fungal diseases as soon as it gets hot. Humidity goes up, starts to rain. So you don't want to grow those things after maybe March 15th at the very latest. If you plant broccoli and cabbage today, what's this? You may be able to squeeze it in, but you're about to run out of time as of tomorrow, probably. So, so you want to get them in really, really quick. Bill asks, are they offering the free compost now? No, they're not. They have a little bit of a pile that they did for um, just kind of test purposes. They have purchased a lot of the equipment. They have this massive screener for screening the compost once it's all done, but they haven't started building the windrows, the huge piles that they have to turn with front end loaders and bulldozers and things like that. But yeah, the program has started. It's in the process. The last I heard is I would think that either late 2024 or early 2025 they'll have it available by the truckload the dump truckload pickup truckload bag load whatever it might be you can go go and buy a couple bags if you for anybody you know who has a small farm or something if you need dump truckloads you'll be able to get that much also and corey i don't know they my guess is they had the shredded yard waste maybe a shoal line. Um, and what that is, is the county does pick up your um, yard waste recycling. And what they do with it right now is they throw it in a big pile. And then every once in a while, they shred it all up and they give it away for free. <clears throat> that can make good mulch. A lot of times that free stuff, it all really depends on what kind, what batch you're getting. I've seen in some counties, it could be really stinky. It could be really nasty kind of thing that if you get a truckload and spread it around your azaleas or your bushes out in front of your house, things may stink to high heaven for a little bit until it settles down. Other counties and other places have fine shredded mulch and it's free. You know, you can't beat free, if, especially if you have a pickup truck or a way of moving it around. So it tends to be hit or miss. This compost that they're going to start making is going to be tested and evaluated by the Compost Society of America. I don't think that's the exact name, but it's a composting certification service that certifies compost nationwide. And they also have a lot of oversight from Florida Department of Environmental Protection. So it's going to be tested, checked, monitored. They're going to check the temperatures test it, make sure it's safe, and it's going to be good compost, good stuff. Can't wait for it to be available. I'll have to try to sweet talk them into bringing a truckload over to my house, dump it, dump it in my driveway, then I get to move it. Yes, that will be fantastic. As far as restrictions on who could buy it, I don't know. I honestly can't tell you. Save that question for Leanna when we have her on really soon. 
Anne Marie asks about a link to um, rain barrels. I'm not sure which link you're talking about, Anne Marie, because we do have rain barrel and compost bin classes here in Hernando County, but they're all in person and you have to um, be a resident here to be able to get the rain barrel or be able to get the compost bin. So if you can, can kind of clear up my confusion on which link you're looking for, Teresa or I would be happy to find it. Okay, Shane has a question. Shane has two Yopon hollies that have been planted in full sun. Okay, they're native. They take full sun. I planted it in the ground with a mix of compost and in-ground soil. That's okay. They're native plants, so you really don't need to work in compost when you're growing native plants. It helps, but it's not an absolute necessity. I watered it a couple times a week for the first few weeks and then reduced it to once a week plus the rain. I haven't seen any growth after a year. Any advice? Depends on what time of year you planted it. If they still look healthy, they still look green, they're just kind of sitting there not doing much of anything, that can be a very good thing because hopefully it's spreading its roots, it's getting well settled in, it's getting better able to find water and take up water during a dry period so you're not going to have to go out there and water the heck out of it because it's a native bush. Native bushes, after they get established and well-rooted, you shouldn't have to water them after that, unless we're in the middle of a major drought. You may have to water it once or twice. So um, hopefully it's spreading its roots. It should start perking up and getting new growth this coming spring. So keep an eye on it. Like I said, if it's still green, but just no new growth and not, not growing or spreading, but definitely not dying, then you're fine. A lot of times, a lot of hedges shrubs bushes flowering plants the first entire year they just kind of sit there don't do much of anything they don't grow but they don't die and what they're doing spreading their roots getting established and then getting all strong and ready and then a lot of times after that first year boom they really take off and grow a lot after that so as and gilpon hollies gosh they don't have any insect problems they rarely have disease problems. They only have disease problems after a really, really wet, humid summer. You might get spots on a couple leaves, but they're about the most, you know, some of the toughest bushes that you could put in. We have a few right out in front of our office here, and they always look great. They never look bad. Nothing ever bothers them. So my kind of plant. And Corey points out that uh, with biochar, there is different quality based on the materials that they use and the quality of the burn. Yes, both of those are very important. And how you burn it and process it is important also. So it's not as simple as they start a big fire, throw a bunch of wood on, then take all the ashes and use them. Clean wood ash you can add to your compost, but it's very alkaline. So don't add too much, but a little bit is very, very good because it's very high in potassium also. But if you work too much wood ash into your garden, you're gonna shoot the pH through the roof. And if you're burning, you know, old pallets and scrap wood, things that are um, uh, maybe pressure treated, you might get, you're gonna get chemicals in the ashes and you don't want that. So if you, if you have a, a little bonfire pit in your backyard, and you're cutting down trees or fallen trees and you're burning clean wood, yeah, you can throw a lot of those ashes and uh, leftover burnt chunks of wood in your compost or even work it directly into your garden. Just not too much. Moderation is very important with that. Okay, Corey, um, I will start looking if I get a chance today. I'm sure we have UF experts on biochar. I just have to hunt them down and then pick a date and uh, make arrangements and everything. Yeah, we'll have a biochar class. I've never done one of those before. Interesting topic. <gasps> but Sam, you have a very, very easy to answer question. Is Thompson grapes a good variety to grow in Central Florida? No. 
they in theory could grow here. The only problem is we have a little insect called the glassy wing sharpshooter and that vectors a disease for uh, European wine grapes that kills them very quickly. So Thompson seedless grapes do not grow here for long. They're going to get that disease and they're going to die from it. Really the only grapes that do well here are the um, native muscadine grapes. There's a lot of different varieties of muscadines and they can be very tasty. They'll grow most of the other varieties, you know, Concord grapes, Thompson grapes, the red seedless grapes, all the different, the Chardonnay ones that, you know, they make all the really good wines out of, they're not going to do well here in Central Florida. So I see Teresa's putting out links to growing cabbage, making biochar. Um, Amory said, oh, um, if Bernie was referring to the rain barrel classes that we have here, Yes, we do have rain barrel classes here in Hernando County. And as a matter of fact, our Florida Friendly Landscape Coordinator, Colby Pitts, is in charge of that. And Colby is not here with me today. So uh, catch Colby the next time he's on. The problem is we have the rain barrels here. And you live way up there in what is it, Madison County, just about Georgia, darn near over the Georgia County line. So you would have to physically come here to get the rain barrel I think you can take the class if you're not a county resident, but you don't get the uh, rebate. So if you are a Hernando County resident, and if you are a customer of Hernando County Utilities, you have to pay for the rain barrel. They just charge you what they paid for it. And they give you a rebate if you're a Hernando County Utilities customer. And you go to the class and you go home with a rain barrel. So go ahead and catch Colby the next time he's on here. or I'll show his email contact info at the end. If you shoot him an email, he runs that. He can tell you a lot more about that than I can. Oh, so Shane says about the Yopon Hollies, it is very green and healthy, just no growth on top. Yeah, that that's very common. It seems like there's a problem with it because they don't do anything for either a few months up to a year or so. That's totally normal with a lot of plants. They just sit there, and then when they do take off, they take off and start to get a lot of new growth and do really well. Because with any new plant, it's really important that those roots spread and grow and kind of go far and wide, as far and wide as that plant's roots are going to go, because that way it's going to find water on its own, and you're not going to have to sit there worrying about watering it all the time, day after day, forever. So Teresa put a link for Yopon Hollies on here. Like I said, very, very durable, definite winner here for Central Florida. Um, Monique asks, is it normal for Walter's Viburnum to lose leaves and look sick for a while before the new leaves come out? This seems to happen every year. Yes, they're going to lose a certain number of leaves. Walter's Viburnum are generally evergreen, but with even with any kind of evergreens, leaves don't last forever. So I have a holly hedge and it's evergreen, but the leaves don't last forever. It's not like every time it makes a new leaf, the leaf is going to be there for 20 years. After a certain point, old leaves are done. They're shot, they fall off, and new leaves replace them. <coughs> so I think Walter's Viburnum, it's normal for them to lose at least some leaves over the winter. They're not going to die from the cold. Here in Central Florida, you don't have to cover them or protect them from the cold we get because they actually need a certain amount of cold to flower in the spring and look really pretty. That's the main reason you, you're growing them is for the white flowers in the spring. So it should be fine, and it, it should leaf out in the spring. Shane also asked, I've read mixed things on Washington Hawthorne. Are they truly native to Florida, and how well do they do here? I don't know the answer to that one. So thankfully, hopefully, I still have Teresa in the background to start looking that one up. We do have native hawthorns here in Florida. 
I know that we don't have a lot of hawthorns here in central Florida, and I'm really not familiar with the Washington hawthorn. So hopefully Teresa can be looking that one up. Oh my gosh, she's quick. Look at this. Okay. Well, Shane, here's your answer. Here's a fact sheet. Uh, uh, Washington Hawthorne. Um, you know, it may be native to Central Florida and just underused. So we do have a lot of native plants that are going to do well in this area that just aren't planted very often or used a lot. I was at a conference yesterday and there was a presentation on uh, new home construction and the landscaping they use over in Lake County. Because Lake County has been growing like crazy, just like here in Hernando. Pasco is still growing like crazy. We're all growing like crazy. And she showed a um, uh, an aerial shot of a big area uh, with housing and shopping center and this and that. And in the whole thing, but on the landscape between the turf grass they use, some ground cover they use, palm trees, other bushes, maybe five species of plants. That was it. There's a lot more that's going to grow well here if you look at Florida-friendly plants and native plants. So there's a lot of plants out there that you can choose from that we're just not using very often. So, uh, Anne-Marie said she made some chow chow relish this week with all of her green tomatoes she picked before the freeze they had oh my god yeah you probably froze up there when we got to 33 just a tiny bit above freezing i got really no damage but it got pretty darn cold i'm sure that you got frozen up there so yeah i mean if you end up with green tomatoes a lot of things you could do with them i've never made chow chow relish before I need to make that. I need to, um, next time I end up with a, a lot of green tomatoes and the other ingredients that go into it, I need to do that. I can. I've canned things before. It's really not very hard. So the ball recipe is wonderful. I have the ball canning book also. If you want to start canning, get the ball canning book and start with the basic things. Follow the directions exactly. That way you know everything's going to be safe and work well and start canning it's really not that hard and teresa got a fact sheet here about from walter's viburnum and other viburnum species also um <laughs> i see the colby is is popping in here also as a commenter good morning he had a county event this morning okay i have a hard enough time figuring out my schedule so you probably told me and i just didn't mark it down or remember but that's okay. Doing just fine here on my own. I don't know why, but it always seems like when I'm on here all by myself, we have like record breaking number of brand new people to watching the plant clinic. All the regulars come on. Everybody has questions and everything just flies by for the, you know, close to an hour. And today's no exception. So <clears throat> for everybody who is on here following us, us live, Thank you so much. There's no way that we could do this without you. We would be awfully bored and lonely. And it would just be me and Colby chatting with each other and Teresa in the background. That's not very exciting. So thank you so much for tuning in live. For everybody who watches the recorded version of this, thank you so much. Also, we really enjoy um, taking the time here to answer your questions, give you advice, chat about what we have going on in our gardens, other questions that we've dealt with over the past week, things that we've learned over the last week. You know, we're all here learning together, basically, because I don't know everything. So if you guys know more about biochar and um, certain different uh, native plants and this and that, I always learn something every week here, too. So it's not just you learning, it's me, too. Um, let's go ahead, go through a few more questions we have here. Cindy is here from Pinellas County. Good morning, Cindy. How are you? I can guarantee you that Cindy did not lose anything to the freeze in her yard. Sure, it got pretty chilly, but, um, I think that you're at least close enough to the coast where you get the benefits of the extra warmth from the Gulf of Mexico 
and helps protect everything in your landscape. Um, Colby will be back next week. And Bernie should be here also. Um, let me check real quick. Am I going to be here also? Dun, 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 dun. Yes, I'll be here next week also. So we'll all be back again next week. And I'll get a hold of Leanna and see if we can't have her come on as a guest. She can explain what they're doing with the um, composting project up there from the perspective of the big equipment and making the big piles of compost when it'll be ready. Oh my gosh, buddy's buddy's throwing some more technical terms here at me. I'll go ahead and mark that down also. Biochar versus humachar. I'm sure University of Florida has somebody in the soil science uh, department or somebody who's an expert on that. We'll I'll I'll work on getting a guest speaker in. David, thank you so much. We really, we, we just eat up your compliments and uh, your emails and your, your, your nice thoughts. And David asked another question uh, about growing Yopon Holly for commercial tea. Yes, I do know of somebody and I can't remember the name of the grower. There's one grower that grows tons of Yopon hollies to be made into tea. They have an exclusive contract with a greenhouse company that I purchase plants from for different um, edible plant classes that we do, which by the way, uh, is called the Growing Groceries series. And we're gonna start doing that again this coming spring. So for anybody listening to my voice who lives in Hernando County or very close to Hernando, what that is, is a class we do charge for it is 20 bucks, but you get three plants from whatever plant we're talking about. And last year we did bananas, blackberries. What else do we do? We did a bunch of other plants, pineapples. So our first one for this coming year, coming up in about a month or so, is going to be Barbados cherries which if you don't know anything about Barbados cherries, go ahead and come back to our Facebook page in about a week after I get all the information up there and you can sign up for that. Like I said, it costs 20 bucks, but you get three plants, but you have to come and pick them up from us. If you live up there in you know, the Panhandle or way far away, we can't ship them. If you wanna come take a beautiful day trip to Hernando County, that's great. You're more than welcome to, but keep that in mind before you sign up for it. So, but I do know of that one company, they have an exclusive contract with the greenhouse growers for Yopon Holly. You'd have to look that up on, online. I can't remember the name of them, but they, they pay them to start thousands of Yopon Holly bushes for them. And I asked them, I said, can you start some for me? Can I buy them? And they said, no, we're under exclusive contracts with them. We're not allowed to grow them for anybody else. So I would have had a class on Yopon Holly, but I can't. Shane, you're very welcome. Um, okay, Diana has a, a computer type question here. Uh, with Facebook platform, uh, maybe someone can help me learn something. On the phone, when I click on a link in the chat, it takes me away from the video and then I miss what is being said. So I try to hurry and open the link in my browser and come back so I don't miss anything. The easy way around that, Diana, is all of these virtual plant clinics that we do, they're all recorded on Facebook. So all the different, so you can, you know, sit here and listen, participate. I have not, I've had to miss a few clinics, but I try to tune in on my phone just to make sure it's still going on, make sure somebody showed up. And it looks great on my phone. I'm just absolutely amazed. And I can watch and I can click likes and the little little hearts and balloons that you can make a call. It's great. But this all gets recorded. So if there's links that you want to go and visit, just wait until after we're all done. 
You can go back to the recording on our Facebook page. We are at our short name is Hernando EXT, short for Hernando Extension. So you can go back to the recorded version and all the links are on there under comments. So you scroll through the comments, click on the links and visit them, you know, at your leisure when you have time to, to look up more information on whether it be Yopon Hollies or some kind of disease or whatever else it is. Um, I'm so thankful to Teresa for being in the background and being so so fast with Google, faster than I am. I use just one finger usually. And looking these things up and sharing the links with you to give you more information on things that I'm not particularly an expert on. And yeah, Cindy, down there in Pinellas County said she's about um, four or five miles away from the water. Yeah, that, that, that's very nice. You guys stay warmer there. Um, I know that we're here in Hernando County. If you go down south, just down to Tarpon Springs, apparently a lot of people grow mangoes down there. So it's definitely a little bit warmer, not that many miles south of here and really, really close to the water. Has a big difference. Corey, thank you. That is who it is, Yopon Brothers Tea. So if you look up Yopon Brothers, they have tons and tons of Yopon Hollies, and they make the tea out of it. Um, it looks like Colby came up with a good suggestion. Every week, we simulcast or live cast this virtual plant clinic to the Hernando County Extension Facebook page. That's located at Hernando dot, or Hernando EXT on Facebook. That's our short name. It also goes to my YouTube channel. It also goes to the uh, University of Florida Central District Extension YouTube channel. We are going to be doing a lot more programming on there. I'm working with extension agents from all over Central Florida. We're going to start doing more joint programming together, live, recorded, all kinds of really good stuff. And we're going to be putting it on that Central District YouTube channel. So we're going to have more information on that coming up. And also, our Hernando County Extension Facebook page has a private gardening group. And we broadcast live to them also. So you can potentially listen to my voice and see my face live on four different platforms if you want. I'm not sure why somebody would want to, but if you had four different devices, you can just have me playing. And there's probably a little bit of a delay, so it would drive you insane with a delay. But yes, we go to four different places. So um, if you don't like watching us live on Facebook or for anybody who does not have Facebook, you can watch us on YouTube. You can watch things live on YouTube. You don't have to log in, you don't have to join, don't have to share information just have to go find it on YouTube and click and watch live and you can ask questions and make comments also. I should be able to see all those comments. I think sometimes I don't get all the comments from our Facebook group, but I do get comments and I can even tell whether they're coming from somebody watching me on Facebook or on YouTube also. So this is a great platform, great opportunity to engage with people and back and forth and ask questions. And it looks like we're, gosh, an hour just flew by um, all by myself here. So let's go ahead and check a couple more comments and questions on here. And Monique says she has a fairly young oak that's now getting really tall and the roots are now coming to the surface. That's normal with oak trees. And that's very important also. Those really close to the surface roots are very important for absorbing water, nutrients, and also gas exchange. So you don't, I haven't read the whole question yet, but if we're getting up to chopping them off, you really don't want to do that. If, any way you can avoid it. So it's in her grass. And yeah, that could be a problem, especially with, um, if you're going over it with a lawnmower or doing trimming the grass with the weed eater, you really want to try to not chew up those roots. Uh, first, she thought it might be from drought, but.
but I think the obvious looking for oxygen, very good. It's normal. It's not really because of drought. So it's spreading out and great for a bed. Can I cut some of the smaller roots? In theory, you can, but you really want to limit that as much as possible. You don't want to be out there with a pickaxe taking out all the close to the surface roots. What that's going to do is it's going to damage your tree and leave cut surfaces underground, which is perfect for diseases and rots to enter the tree. And what might happen is you're going to have a problem with that oak tree. It's going to die on one side. It's going to drop its leaves. Potentially the whole tree is going to die. And that's going to happen five years down the road. So trees work on a really slow calendar. Things you do today are going to impact your tree potentially three to five years down the road. So if you have to cut out one small root, you can. You just want to try to, to limit it as much as you possibly can. Diana, uh, like I said, uh, we will be having a class on Barbados cherries. And what these are is, is a it's a plant that grows between large shrub or a bush or a very small tree. And they get little round berries or cherries. This is not the same as sweet cherries that you buy at the grocery store. They grow in Michigan. You cannot grow them down here because they need a lot more cold weather than what we're ever going to get here in Florida because they grow in like Michigan and California. And our summers are too hot and steamy for them. If you don't, don't go out and buy a traditional cherry tree and plant it here, probably going to die pretty quickly during the first summer. But these are native to the tropics and they grow really well here and they will get little cherries, very high in vitamin C, very, very tasty, very tasty in adult beverages, I believe, but also very sour. But you know, sugar will fix that right up. So if you, you know, make a cocktail, whatever, you know, there's ways to get around the, the, the sourness. So, yeah, Diana, if you ever want to catch the links, wait until we're done live. And then if you go back, all the links stay there. They stay there forever, I think. Um, okay, I have a question from Corey. Um Yes, Corey is asking about the live feed when we go to our Facebook group. Because when you comment from the Facebook group, Facebook asks your permission, can we use your name? And you have to click yes. If you don't, you'll always appear to me as Facebook user. So I will normally see your comments, but not your name. So um, Facebook. Book, the Facebook group, every time I create a link, which I do every week, I'm going to do it again this afternoon for next week's uh, plant clinic. When I set it to broadcast through the group, it starts to chat. So there's a ton of chats in there that people could chat on and ask questions. But if you want to watch the live broadcast, you have to go to the home page of the group, the main front page where all the most recent posts are, and that's where you're going to see me live, if that makes any sense. So watching this on the Facebook group, probably the most confusing. Facebook page, pretty simple. Don't have too many problems with that. Either YouTube channel is probably going to be by far the easiest. You just go to the YouTube channel and we're showing live. I see a comment, and this should be from Teresa. So going back to oak trees, so as the oak tree grows, the taproot is outgrown by an extensive lateral root system that spreads horizontally out from the trunk, well beyond the drip line, sometimes as much as 90 feet. So for mature oaks, that horizontal root system is the primary supporter of the tree. That is true because 
if you're from up north, trees up north more frequently have tap roots, the one big one that goes straight down, and that keeps northern trees anchored. Here, the roots that go side to side normally keep it anchored. So oaks do have roots that go down, but a lot of them go side to side, and they're very, very important for the tree. And Teresa put um, a link to the um, University of Florida fact sheet on Barbados cherries. I have a blog post also that I wrote about them for a few cases you never heard of a Barbados cherry. It tells you uh, the basics. And Cindy would like to let Lily know that she, and also Teresa, Teresa will like this, she kept a special area of Spanish needle for the bees. When it's trying to take over the yard, yeah, it does that. They drop bajillions of seeds and they all come up. Not too happy about that, but I left it for the bees because it was so cold. Yeah, leaving a patch of Spanish needle. It's called Spanish needle, Spanish bayonet. Uh, Biden Zalba has a lot of different names. Biden Zalba is the scientific name. Um, the weeds, they get the little white daisy-like flowers. Bees love them. They flower pretty much year-round unless you've just had a freeze. They'll stop for a little bit and die back. Very good for pollinators. Very good for bees. Very good for a lot of other beneficial insects. And Teresa says, yes, it's a very important nectar and pollen plant. Um, hmm. <clears throat> Lynn says the mulberry link is a 404 page moved. I got an email the other day that a lot of University of Florida fact sheets just got sunsetted, which is every couple of years, whoever wrote it has to reread it, update it, make changes of it and go, this is still current, accurate information. Otherwise, University of Florida takes it down, at least temporarily, until somebody steps up, reviews it, gets it peer-reviewed, verifies the information is correct, and then it gets published once again on the website. So, Teresa, you may encounter even more fact sheets. When you look them up, you'd be able to go to it, but it's not available. It's been taken down at least temporarily. And Monique, it looks like Monique has uh, Spanish needles also. So really, really great. Gosh, it attracts butterflies, bees, pollinators. Great for if you're raising honeybees or you have them in the area. Or you're just trying to help the honeybees out. Really, really. And you know, you don't have to do anything to the plant <laughs> to get it to grow. It is truly the toughest weed that you will ever have in your yard. So why fight it? Just Give it a little section in your backyard and let it grow. Keep it from spreading and taking over your entire yard. But why fight it? So Corey says, yeah, he was wondering what happened to some of the UF resources. That can always happen. But they, I, I just got an email just a few days ago that they sunsetted a whole bunch of them. So a bunch may be kind of missing for a little bit until they get on the researchers and have them get on the stick to re-review the papers because they don't just take research and a fact sheet, put it up there and leave it up there for 20 years. Things change. You know, they find, you know, new discoveries, new information, things spread, um, you know, plants, the new discoveries about how to grow them, how to best grow them. And, you know, life changes, and that needs to be reflected on current and updated materials because we only want to give you the, the freshest and most accurate information there is. Is freshest the best term for that? I'm not sure. So let's go ahead and start showing a couple of uh, kind of wrap-up links here. If you have any further questions, need to get in touch with me, there is my email. If you'd like to contact our office, there is our phone number. Teresa is here today. Like I said, Bernie is gone for this week. He's off at a conference, but he'll be back next week. Um, our Master Gardener Nursery, 
here in Brooksville is open every Wednesday and Saturday morning from 8.30 in the morning until noon right now because it's winter and the weather's nice. So be sure to stop by. They have a great assortment of native and Florida-friendly plants, and they are happy to answer your questions there at the nursery also. We have a wealth, a plethora of past recorded classes on Hernando County Government's YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, look at the little box up on the top, and type in Hernando County Government, hit the little, little magnifying glass, and the, your first choice should be the Hernando County Government's YouTube channel. If you go on there and look on the playlists, there's one for me. I have a lot of recorded classes. Florida Friendly Landscaping has a, a lot of them. Uh, Lily still has over 100 classes recorded on there. So a lot of good learning, a lot of good information from there. And um, for anybody who wants to get in touch with Colby, there is Colby's email. And if you want to get in touch with anything that he has going on, uh, his email, their Facebook page, information on um, rain barrels and compost bin classes, if you go to his link tree, there's a whole bunch of links there because that's what link tree is for. And um, I think that's about all I got there. Let's go ahead and check for any last minute um, questions and comments. But Sam, thank you so much. We really like these kind of comments. You know, one day, Teresa, we need to pull together and put in the links contact information for all of our bosses so that everybody who watches the plant clinic can shoot them an email because every little bit helps especially when it comes time for, for annual uh, reviews and raises and things like that. So, hey, there we go. Teresa found my blog post um, on Barbados cherries. So that's going to tell you even more about them and whether you want to grow them in your yard or not. I definitely want one. Um, they're generally very carefree. Uh, attractive bush, also a, a large, small leaf, thick bush looks good in the landscape but flowers and gives you little high in vitamin c tart fruits and i want to find out what kind of you know adult uh beverages you could put them in also monique thank you so much you're very very welcome and Anne marie keep warm up there you're a lot further north than we are here i know we've seen some cold weather recently and it's got to be a whole lot colder up where you live um Gosh, all these nice thank yous. We'll, we'll just keep going for a few minutes, more minutes here, Teresa. Um, make sure everybody sees how much uh, we're appreciated. But thank you so much. That's really great. We're more than happy to come on here just as often as we can. Next week, I will be back with Colby and with Bernie. And I will try to get a hold of uh, Leanna with Hernando County Solid Waste Department. If she's free next week, we'll have her on. Otherwise, I'm going to start having other uh, Florida-friendly landscape coordinators from around Central Florida and other horticulture agents. We're just going to have all kinds of people on here for um, special guests. And what is this? This is late January. You know, in the not-too-terribly-distant future, it's going to be the beginning of April. And the beginning of April means that we're going to have an anniversary for the virtual plant clinic. This coming April 1st will technically be our four year anniversary of doing this. And April 1st falls on a Monday. That's a little, that's not a Thursday, so that's not going to work. Um, probably March 28th. The end of March, we are going to have our big four-year anniversary special show, and I'm going to try to get a whole bunch of different special guests on here. We'll try to think of some creative and fun things to do. I'll have to have Lily back. I don't care where Lily is in her RV. She could be in Yellowstone, but she's still going to have to get on her phone and be on here because without Lily's help, I never could have done this. Without Teresa's help, I'd be absolutely lost, and we couldn't do this. 
And a lot of you guys have been with us either since the very beginning or almost the very beginning. Corey's one of our uh, loyal followers, along with a lot of other people. So, hey, guys. Oh, it's a little bit after 11. I got to run. I got another meeting I got to go to. So thank you so much for joining us today. And we'll be back again 10 o'clock next Thursday morning. So be sure to tune in then. Until then, thanks, everyone. Bye.